Welcome home. We are WNST, AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. It is, uh, it's after opening day. It's uh, what we do now that you look forward to baseball for five months, finally get down there, and uh, decent weather. I mean, it could have been a whole lot worse on Thursday for opening day. We are taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour on the road. Uh, I had, Luke, you'll be happy to know, I had my first ever Fadley's Crab Cake. Not really. First ever Fadley's Crab Cake at the new location. So it really was the first crab cake ever at the new location. Uh, all new equipment, all new space. It's 50 yards from where the other one was. Packed, packed. I showed up, you know, about a uh, quarter to one, one o'clock, a little bit of a line. It was the most delicious crab cake I've ever had at Fadley's. All new equipment. Like it was, it was delightful. It was delectable. So get down there, get some coconut, or, or, excuse me, cucumber salad and uh and get some french fries and get that mac and cheese we're gonna be there on friday the 9th um and that we, or excuse me that friday night friday the 12th the 9th we're gonna be at costas uh, on tuesday next week we're still hiatusing just because of april fools and because i'm trying to settle in to the fact that luke i just want to start with this people ask me all over the stadium did you get in the pre-? no i did not i actually had someone from david rubenstein's group be very very kind to me on opening day so i'm just going to begin with that and say that it was the first time and you know this to be true the first time a- an orioles employee has spoken to me in well over 18 years so uh, i am pleased about that i am pleased about the outcome i'm pleased about the enthusiasm um, I don't know. I don't know what I, what would I not be pleased about on opening day? What What would you find to complain about other than it could have been a little sunnier? Yeah, it could have been a little sunnier, although I did see the sun peek out just as it was setting at the ballpark as I was wrapping up post-game coverage uh, after an 11-3 to win. The press conference with David Rubenstein was a little clunky but look, there was a civic tragedy. The, the governor was there. There were non-baseball local media and and maybe even some national media for all I knew uh, that were at that press conference. You know, they didn't have a lot of time for questions. The, the the early indications of Rubenstein and this ownership, you know, this partner partnership group is we'll have some opportunities for more of that because there are lots of questions that face this organization in the long run beyond an 11 to three win on, on open day and Corbin Burns looking uh, just incredible. But you you use the word delightful uh, in describing your experience at Fadley's. And I think that really summed up most of the day. I mean, there was not a whole lot to complain about. Corbin Burns didn't throw a single pitch with a runner on base in six innings. Mike Trout's home run, literally the only blemish and just a dominant performance. The bats were alive early on. They score 11 runs. Uh, everyone in the Everybody lineup, got to see we... Mike Trout play. How about that? Just for that, we got to see Mike Trout play. Mike Trout and Anthony Rendon, I mean, who has played next to, I mean, his playing time has been next to nothing the last couple of years uh, because of injuries. Uh, You forget what kind of player he can be, but he hasn't been on the field. So I'd even say I'd bet that, you know, it was okay that Otani wasn't there, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and and that was what I tweeted out after Trout hits the home run uh, with two outs in the first inning. I said, okay, Shohei Otani may no longer be in Anaheim, but Mike Trout still is lo and behold, that was the only highlight for the Angels who, okay, they scored a couple of runs in the eighth inning when they were already down 10 runs, but a great day at the ballpark. Uh, I, I saw you make the comment. I saw some others make the, you know, pose the question, where did this rank among opening days for Orioles fans? I mean, it's certainly way up there. I mean, I, I can't sit here and say that I have a recollection of every opening well, day. Well, they've never Orioles had an history. opening day after winning the division in 101 games. Let's start with that. They've never had an opening day with like a human being who's an owner who comes out and waves to people and goes over to Pickles and buys people beer. So like, yeah, there's some weird ish going on here. You know, like it, 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 I said to my wife, I came home and I'm like, somebody from the Orioles was nice to me. Like it's never happened. I mean, literally, not, I got tears in my eyes. I, I don't. I told you I did not ever, and you know this. I mean, you've known me a long time. I never, ever spoke of the day after Peter Angelos died and the day after he sold the team. I just, I never thought like that. I I never did. Um, I didn't think like that two months ago, for crying out loud. So this is one of those, can you imagine if there were a new owner? Can you imagine if the team were really good? Can you imagine if there were a new day? Can you, like, can you imagine if there were a new lease? (laughs) You, you know, just all of that. 
We ain't had any of that in 30 years around here. So, um, I, I don't know. It's uh, it was a beautiful thing to witness, and it was beautiful to walk through the ballpark and have people yelling at me and saying things and being enthusiastic and high fiving and um, I don't know. It's um. Uh, it's a demarcation point, right? Like it's you, you mentioned very much when Steve Pashotti and Eric DaCosta were hiding from me in darkness and running like cowards the other night at the hotel. You said it all changed when Ray Rice punched his wife in the elevator like that. That changed everything for the or changed everything about the way they communicate. Well, I, I, you know, I feel like new ownership should change everything about the baseball team, but we never envisioned this. And it could it couldn't come at a better time for the city, for the tragedy, for our fans, for. Just, it, it's just, it's beautiful. It, it reminded me, you asked me, this is my favorite opening day. I was there when Sorrento hit the bomb, right? You know, I was there when Suckliff took the mound. I was there, you know, I was there in 92. That was pretty amazing. You know, and I'm thinking about, I'm getting a little, getting a little something going on here with, you know, my skin. But, um, you know, opening day that day when the stadium was new and fresh, I don't know. It almost felt like the thing was new and fresh in some way all over again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that, that's that's a fair assessment. And look, I mean, th the excitement was already there for the club, you know, for the team on the field, and they certainly performed uh, in a way that you would hope on, on opening day. And it's one and zero, and you hope it's the the first of many, many, many wins, whether it's a hundred one or whether it's ninety five or what, whatever it is that lands them in the postseason. But I'll go back to something that I mentioned. And, and look, I, as I said to you, the the, the press conference it was clunky. It is what it is at this point. I don't think David Rubenstein is the one who's sitting there planning that out. And again, amidst uh, a, the aftermath of a civic tragedy uh, and people who had questions for the governor and whatnot. But I'll go back to something that Rubenstein said during his press conference that really resonated on the heels of everything you just said about how special opening day was. He was very blunt, very direct. He did not mince words in saying, I don't want today, I don't want this moment, I don't want me buying the franchise to represent the high water mark. And I thought that resonated in such a way because you just expressed so much optimism that, yes, comes with every opening day to some extent, right? Hope springs eternal. Uh, every, maybe other than Oakland right now, all, all 30 uh, franchises, there there's some semblance of at least a little bit of hope, even even if you're not expected to do, to do much on the field uh, in 2024. But he flat out said, like, I don't want this to be the, the, the best memory of our, our group coming in and buying the club, although certainly uh, they made it a memorable, memorable, memorable day, uh, even with what you were talking about, with what happened over at Pickles, with uh, the, the investor group buying around for, for everyone over there. But he flat out said, like, I want the high water mark to be this October or some October in the very near future where we're winning a World Series. And, you know, uh, again, goes back to what we talked about, what, two months ago now? Th this idea, just being able to imagine raising the bar for this franchise on the field, off the field, baseball, business, Masson or whatever TV is going to look like in the coming weeks, months, and years. Uh, all of those different factors, uh, presence in the community, all of those different things, just being able to dare to raise the bar. It was a great start on opening day. Uh, it really was in a lot of ways. The energy, play on the field, new ownership group, fans, enthusiasm, everything you mentioned, people lifting each other up, uh, honoring uh, some of the emergency responders, uh, as far as the, the tragedy with the key bridge. I mean, there was, you know, the, the, there was a, there was a, an appropriate somber tone that, that needed to be struck uh, in the aftermath of what happened to early Tuesday morning. But uh, I think at the same time, there was so much optimism and, and just such a, a, a feeling of a rebirth, a reawakening uh, for the franchise. And, and you hope for the city uh, in, in a lot of ways as well. It was, a, it was a great day. It, it really was. And and that's before we even get into what happened on the field, as I mentioned. I mean, how about the fact that the Orioles had a guy that we knew when they acquired him two months ago? He's a legitimate ace, arguably the best pitcher in the National League over the last five years. Coming to Baltimore and look, he kind of statistically speaking, didn't have a great spring to the point where, you know, you're, you're most diehard of Orioles fans who pay close attention to spring training were kind of suggesting like hey what, what's going on and he said Dude, over I spent and over seven days with you last week i think you brought it up three times that he, he didn't look good just privately in the car with me in conversation and yeah. and and you said on the air last week uh, 
let's see him touch a major league. I mean, I yeah. used to go down. I listen. I used to hang out with Messina down at spring training. You know this, and I and like he didn't take it all that seriously. You, you know what yeah. I mean? Like ever, 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 ever. On the field, off the field, whatever. He was just working things out. It's practice. Mm-hmm. It's chance to go throw. I think Corbin Burn. Once you win a Cy Young and you got some money in the bank and you're you're pitching for a contract, you're not laying it on the line in Fort Myers or in Dunedin on a Tuesday night if for you know 42 pitches or whatever it is on a, in March. Um, uh, you know, Corbin Burns looked like he had some serious business to take care of on on uh, uh, here for the fans and for the American League and for a new franchise. And for him saying he ain't won anything in Milwaukee, I, you know, I saw some Milwaukee Brewers jerseys, which are always really good looking jerseys, by the way, uh, yeah. even though I still hate Jim Gantner and Don Money and Robin Yount and <laughs> Gorman Tom. I can go through. I love Sisto, though. We never, never talk bad about Sisto Lescano ever. Not on this program. Um, but the Brewers unis were out. A guy lying in front of me in Fadley's had a Burns uh, blue, you know, powder blue going on. And I thought, man, you know, when's the last time we imported a pitcher like this? I'm thinking like, key you, you know you, you like know, it, I, I go ahead it's funny you mentioned that because i was just trying to think of debut and, and we're not talking like you know mike messina's first you're talking day about start. imported debut exactly. opening day starter as you're talking about yeah and, and jimmy I don't know, key, we had palmer forever he was ours right you know we, we didn't have to go buy him for a long time right right and, and it's funny you mentioned it not that jimmy key was dominant against kansas city in 97 but remember messina what was it was that the year he had the blister I, he, ah, he didn't pitch opening maybe. day. He had, and Jimmy Key had to start on opening day. He went six innings, I think gave up two runs, something along those lines. And, but this was, that was a good start. That was a, a nice, Hey, way to step in and start on well, opening Jimmy day. Jimmy Key was at the end. Yeah. Exactly. Gordon Burns is about to get the big contract in the middle. If he can keep his arm on, which is always an issue for a pitcher. Right. So. Exactly. I mean, even last year, I mean, Kyle Gibson started on opening day, you know, I mean, it was, he pitched, well, I mean, it was fine, but this is this was different. This was, holy cow! He's a dude. You saw, <laughs> you saw the cutter, you saw the curve, you saw the slider, swing and miss with all of that stuff. Eleven strikeouts. I mean, he was dominant. That I, I always go back to something, and Buck didn't coin this term, but he used it a lot. Uh, you hear baseball guys say, "That's what it looks like." Right when they're talking about a dude, whether you're talking about an ace, whether you're talking about a bopper in the middle of the lineup, that's what it looks like. Well, you talk about an ace, that's what it looked like on Thursday. I mean, Burns was dominant, and I mean, he threw 82 pitches. I mean, Hyde took him out early because he knows, hey, I want him to make uh, 32 more starts. And he, you know, guys aren't fully built up coming out of spring training. So, I mean, he could have gone at least another inning. You know, he would have if this was late April rather than late March. I mean, he was, he was terrific. And I'll say this. It's probably one of those half dozen starts where you literally have everything going in. And he flat out said that in his post game comments as uh, people are hearing as they're listening to us uh, today and through and uh, over the course of the weekend uh, as he reflects. But he had everything going uh, and the, the movement, you know, the curveball was biting the slider. His cutter has been one of the best pitches in baseball for you know, the last five years now. He was excellent. I don't know if his stuff itself will be that dominating every time out, and, and he'll have full co- a command of his pitches to that degree. But you see what it looks like when he's on, and I get it. It's the Angels. Expectations are very low for that club uh, on the heels of Otani uh, uh, making the short trip down the road to, to Dodger Stadium. But that's exactly what you wanted to see from Burns. It's exactly what you wanted to see from the Orioles on opening day. And uh, now we... Look, turn to the remaining uh, remaining 161 games, and uh, the optimism uh, is as high as it needed to be uh, on opening day. That's for sure. Well, Luke Jones can be found at Baltimore, Luke. Uh, I could have hold up my Maryland lottery 10 times to cash tickets. I probably should have like hung out of Faithless and given some of these out and done a promotion, but this documentary has been eating me up. Being out on the roads, eating us up. Having the bridge go down has just been um, – you know, I was downtown – all day on uh, on Thursday, and I drove home um, through the tunnel, and when I came out, for whatever reason, I never looked to the right. Um, I went ho- – I, I grabbed food. I, I took Chris Pica home to his uh, beautiful estate in Federal Hill through traffic. I fought t- traffic to get Pica home, um, and then I went through the tunnel, and I realized when I got, like, to my home, like, at Eastern Avenue – 
that I I didn't look up to to see the bridge being gone. So I still have not looked to the sky and seen that the bridge is gone. I, I and I'm getting cowardly about it. I like I, I, I started to drive on 95 right there past Kane Street going north toward the split. And I thought, I haven't seen it yet. When am I really going to go look? For it? Is this going to be Memorial Stadium where I just avoid it? I can't avoid it. I drive to Dundalk all the time. My kid lives there. So at some point, um, it's going to hit me even harder. Um, you, you know, I, I, I guess for all of what's happened here, you, know, you and I were away. We're in a hotel room with screaming Disney kids in Lake Buena Vista. Um, the, the, the bridge goes down. We get home. It's crazy. Everything here has been crazy the last couple of days. The baseball, the healing part of baseball that we talk about where baseball makes you feel good and completes the city and completes. I talked in those terms all of my life until Peter bought the team, right? Like there has been very, very little hope, hope, as we'd say here um, in recent times. I don't even know how to handle it. You know what I mean? I don't even I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, I I am an optimist by nature. We're Baltimore positive. Sometimes it doesn't come across that way. But certainly if you speak to me in private terms, I, I don't speak about the end of the world. I speak about what great things going to happen next um, for you with the team and whatever the ceiling would be through this. What did Rubenstein get asked and what did, is there anything you glean from the ownership side that you want to say about that? Because you and I are going to talk baseball a lot. I don't know that you and I are going to talk ownership a lot. And I don't know that – I mean, this guy's not going to be Peter Angelos. He's not going to be on the phone yelling at George Steinbrenner and up in the middle of the night drunk yelling at Peter Schmuck and, like, you know, firing people and torturing Kevin Brown. And, like, I I don't vibe that this guy's going to do that at all. I also, from talking to some of his people, I don't vibe that he's really put a whole lot of thought into what it's going to be like to be a baseball owner. Like literally, like he's a billionaire. He's done other things in his life. This is a piece of a portfolio that's supposed to be fun for him and community mm-hmm. spirit and all that. I, in the same way, when Peter bought the team five minutes in, he had fired everybody, tortured everybody. Lakino was gone. Rick Vaughn, no, he was leaving. I mean, everybody needed to get out and they did. I don't know how the people that work there feel or like they're going to stay or whether I don't think he's come into this with any great like management team or this or that or major changes or who his COO is going to be or who his CEO. Like we haven't heard any of that. And look, I found out for a fact that the wire transfer happened Wednesday night. So the money just landed in the account. And he woke up and went down and was buying beer for everybody and doing press conferences after a tragedy. So I don't know what the big picture is. I'll be on eye of that. But what what do you think or see or feel? Or is there nothing different for you? Look, I ran into TJ Brightman. I saw Lucasaurus running around in a suit, running the place, like working. I, I mean, I saw all the Angelos people were there. I saw George Stamos. I mean, I saw the Angelos, everybody but John and Peter. And I, I haven't seen Peter in 20 years. Um the Angelos people are still running the team. I mean, that's very I, – I wasn't at the press conference, so trust me when I say that. But what did you sense about it? Because I sensed – I don't know. I, I, I never know what the transition is going to feel or look like, right? Like, you never know. But I do sense that this guy, he loves baseball, but I don't think he knows much about the business of baseball. You know what I mean? Like, and nor did Peter, nor did Steve when he bought the team. Like, like how this really worked. I probably know a whole lot more about it than he does because I've been around it for 35, 40 years. Certainly knew more about it than the person from his group that I spoke to who didn't know a lot of baseball. And I'm just thinking, like, there's a lot to learn, but if you're a good person, and I so far so good, you have to know the history of the unraveling of what's going on the last 30 years, and I'm not even really sure that they know how bad it was or and and how nice it is just to have somebody like stand in front of you with a straight face and tell you they're not going to lie to you. Well, first of all, I mean, a couple things there. Look, I mean, the optimism's there. I mean, that's stating the obvious. Right. And and, and the baseball talked about it, there. the baseball <laughs> and the baseball team's really good. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and that was true before this transaction took place. So but that hasn't we, been true much at all. <laughs> oh, no, no question right. about it. But it was. Uh, yeah. I mean, if there's one thing you can credit John Angelos for, it's hiring Michael Eyes and largely getting out of the way, at least from a baseball standpoint. He left now, it better than he found it in that way. No doubt he about did. it. He did. <laughs> but that said, there's the business side. There's mass and there, there's ticket sales. There's there's a, a changing media landscape. I mean, the, the question that I wanted to pose to David Rubenstein, and again, there was next to no time 
Uh, I think there were five questions total. A couple were about the bridge posed to Governor Moore, even though there was, from what I understand, a press conference that followed uh, that was specifically for that. That was not communicated to, to those in attendance. I mean, again, from a, a production standpoint, the press conference left a lot to be desired. Again, I'm under I'm understanding there's a lot going on beyond just the future of the baseball team this week, especially uh, and these coming weeks and months, especially. Uh, but the question that I had, which you and I've talked about, I mean, hey, we know the state of regional sports networks in baseball and around the country. We know the state of subscribing for traditional cable and satellite is in rapid decline. I wanted to know what's your out outlook for Masson? Uh, what's your outlook for the need to provide more direct to consumer uh, viewing options for people in this market, not just MLB TV, where you can watch it out of market. So that was one of the first questions I had uh, that was not even asked, let alone answered. So look, everything feels great right now and understandably so, justifiably so, uh, but you just laid it out. And I think that's why it's going to be so critical to see who Rubenstein and this group hires to run things, you know, whether we're talking about the CEO, whether we're talking about, hey, some people within the organization are going to be retained and are going to, 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 to be here. But I'd also say, and I think I said this to you as I bumped into you in the club level also ever so briefly uh, on Thursday, a year from now, I'm guessing the infrastructure of the organization is going to look different. Probably not as much on the baseball side, but everything else, it could look very different. Uh, and, and frankly, it kind of needs to uh, when we've talked about uh, the, the ways in which the, the organization has been run poorly uh, for a long time. So I think it's important to recognize there is going to be an evaluation period here that I think Rubenstein and, and the partners and whoever he ultimately hires to, quote, run the place, whoever is his Dick Cass, uh, when Steve Bishotti took over from Art Modell, you know, bought the remainder of the franchise uh, 20 years ago. Uh, there's going to be that transition in place. So I think some patience is in order. I think it's important to recognize what you just said, that it doesn't appear that he has or, or the people around him necessarily have a great idea of how things need to be run. So there's going to be a, a learning curve to this. So I think that's where I go back to what I said at the beginning of our conversation. And, and this is why this comment resonated for me so much. All these good feelings we're talking about right now, it's great and much needed given what's happened uh, this week here in Baltimore. But I go back to what he said. I don't want this to be the high watermark for our partnership group, you know, our, 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 me and the, and the partners coming in today. I, I want this to be the start of what's approaching a high watermark of winning a World Series, cultivating good relationships in the community, being successful and profitable from a business standpoint. Because ultimately, to your point, it's an investment for him. He loves the Orioles, but he didn't sign up for this to lose money either, right? Uh, I mean, he wants to. He wants to. I be also successful. Think, don't think he signed up for this to have an office in the warehouse and be there ten hours a week and counting paper clips and you know all that. But I have a feeling he'll be at sixty baseball games this summer at the ballpark. I have a feeling going to the games when you get to be that age and you own the team. I mean, Peter hated the team. He hated everything about everything. I mean, literally, he didn't never went to the games. He never like like I think he wants to enjoy this and I think he'll be a part of it. I don't think he's going to be opening day and the next time you'll see him at the ballparks, August 21st. Like I, I, I think it's a new fun toy for him, but I don't think he's going to get involved in in any way in day to day. He's going to have a, a, a guy, you know, what I mean, somebody's going to sit or a girl or he's going to sit in that seat and run it. I, I don't envision him being a guy who's going to be having a lot of press conferences around the team. I don't know. I think in the early going, there's so much work that needs to be done. And I hope he understands that. I hope his guy did not understand trauma and terrorism of, of Peter Angelos. Like literally when I was speaking to him, he really didn't let alone a grasp of who I am or what we do or any of that, sure. like did not have a grasp of the history of baseball, did not have a grasp of, like how bad Peter was. And I, I, I was a little shocked and I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm happy to tell you it's not happy stories. I mean, but I, I don't, I, I don't know much about this guy. I mean, I really don't like as much as he's yeah, well, a public guy and whatever I judge people based on what I see from them so far. So good in that. Sure. 
he's here and cares. And, but it, I don't think this is going to be an absentee ownership. But I don't think it's going to be sort of helicopter in and out either. I, I don't. I don't believe that. Yeah, well, I mean, and you just said it. I mean, all we have to go off of is what he's done. He's been a philanthropist. Uh, he, he's been very charitable. Uh, I, I I think it was evident, and I know I, I didn't get the chance to hear it, but I know he was on the Mass and Telecast and was talking about his love for baseball. Mentioned what? Who his favorite player was, which I think you, you'd you probably enjoy mentioning. Uh, but Well, I was wearing a 11 jersey. Fan. Yeah, yeah, I was, you know. Yeah, he's I, a fan. Mentioned Louis Aparicio. And, and, I mean, Palmer, no less. There, there's so I, I said, much. don't patronize right. Palmer. I've already called Palmer the greatest Oriole. They said, he's the greatest pitcher. No, he's the greatest Oriole, but don't tell him that. His head's already big enough. So, let <laughs> you know, let, 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 let somebody love Kurt Bleffrey more or, you know, Belanger or something like that. You know, let, 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 let the owner of the Orioles be an Aparicio fan let that it's all the favor you know yeah absolutely so but you you pointed it out there is a lack of experience here in terms of owning a baseball team running a baseball team have it knowing what you want in the people that are going to run things for you so that's where I said there is going to be a learning curve here and that's where it is important to pump the brakes a little bit and that's not to be negative that, that's just to be realistic with where they are right now and it's being as patient I, being patient right, right? Yeah. I, I think patient is the appropriate term here now look that doesn't mean they can't do things in terms of if they need to go out and add another pitcher go out and add another bullpen arm uh extend adley rutschman for example i mean you asked me what could have made opening day better maybe it would have been announcing an extension with adley rutschman or gunner henderson you know whatever it is but the point is some of those things can be done, but in a big picture sense, in a global sense, what's going to happen with the franchise in terms of the leadership team? Who's going to stay? Who's going to go? Uh, because that's that's inevitable. Change is inevitable. Whenever you have a change in ownership, uh, th that person or those persons presumably are going to bring in some of their own people. Some might stay, and, and I'm not going to wish any ill will towards any individuals uh, that work within the organization, but there are going to be some changes. And that's why I said, maybe not, in the midst of, of a season now, as it's often running, and you don't want to necessarily be swimming upstream and making changes in the midst of, of a baseball season uh, over the next six months, but there'll be some changes at least. And, and really, I, I think the opening day next year is going to be a much better litmus test in terms of what the vision is for this new ownership group. So lots of optimism, lots of excitement, but also lots of unanswered questions. And, and again, that's where it was. As a journalist, I was a little disappointed uh, in how the press conference came across, but I'm also understanding, again, patience to your point. Uh, what we have well, seen here's the, the thing. At a press conference like this, when they do this stuff like Leonsis and they go run off into the distance, or Bashadi, who ran like a cockroach in the middle of the night when the lights went on from me the other night, afraid of me, when that – so when they're running – uh, it's not the last Rubenstein press conference. You know what I mean? Right. Like, right. I, I think he'll be around, and I think sure. – once there's a level of what all of this is and he realizes how little media there really is in the city and people like me that want to put on an orange shirt and come down, that he seemed like a pleasant enough guy to be reasonable enough. I mean, this has been a very unusual thing after the Ray Rice incident in Bashadi because Bashadi, the first 10 years, was around and was pleasant, came, put me in his limo and took me to his home. He had to pee. I let him pee. But um, like it wasn't weird. Until Steve made it weird and Peter made it okay to be absent in a town like Baltimore, giving people like me the middle finger when all I've done support the team and been here while they're on a boat in Bimini and have disappeared. So we haven't done an NFL owners meeting thing. I think we're doing pieces of it in here and we'll do that next week. But like if if it's a press conference – on the heels of a tragic – well, let's just go back uh, 14 months ago, right? John Angelos had a press conference purposely on Martin Luther King Day, purposely to write a $1 million check, purposely to sit next to the African-American governor, purposely to invite media and then screamed at Dan Connolly and then was never hurt and said, come down and check out the books and never was shown up again. That's the last act of the guy who owned the team before this guy. So this guy shows up, two questions, and he's out the door. You're like, what, 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 what? well, okay. Right. If he comes back a week and a half from now and says, I'm here, or if he's holding court with you guys in the back of the press conference at 5 o'clock because he came to the ballpark early, and right? I mean, and not just for right. Rock and the employees well, I'm, and the, 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 you know, the people that are there to, to 
pat him on the back and keep their jobs like TJ Brightman. Like I'm talking about like if he's available, Peter, Peter Angelo said to me, people still come up to me. I had five people say this to me on Thursday. I'm a very available individual. You want to meet with me? You call me anytime. I have plenty of time for everyone. If Rubenstein, if, if the next press conference for Rubenstein's next opening day, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, exactly. so, yeah, I, so I mean, and I'll, I'll put that out. Right, but I mean, I'm, I believe he will not be that guy. And until he's that guy, I got an open heart and uh, visa and master charge to buy the Birdland package and come down, uh, provided I get my media pass back, because that that's first and foremost for me. Um, but. I, I want to participate. I want to play. I want to have fun. I want to report on the team. I want to take you and me to Kansas City to see games and eat big steaks and barbecue. And, like, I want to do all of that. Um, and time will tell. But to your point, so far, so good. I, I got There's yeah. zero complaints after day one. <laughs> I mean, so in the team, right, right. 36 hours. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you just said it. I mean, large parts of this are TBD. And that's okay, right? I mean, based on what we've seen so far, it's – Really, really, really promising. And I'll go back to something that you said a couple minutes ago. I mean, the idea that he'll be there for 60 games, whatever the number is. Uh, he seems at least very willing, whether he's truly comfortable or not. I mean, this is – he's been in the spotlight before. I mean, this guy, you know, he's a billionaire, right? I mean, there, there's a, a certain amount of, yeah, you have to be in the spotlight to, to – reach you know uh, attain that kind of financial success at least uh, and hit different things that he's been involved in but we've seen him and look the cynic would say okay those are photo ops and yes they are photo ops but he's still doing them he, he's still going to the oriole store i mean the, the the fan that ran down the orange carpet as the the tenth man so to speak uh that was a a, a young boy that he met at the Orioles store about a month ago. You know, he was in there, met him and his mother, and uh, they picked him to be the the fan of the of the year. You know, when you own the team, team, you can do stuff like that. Yeah, Good. but, but, you, but should, you should be Willy Wonka. I right. mean, that's what you should sure. be doing. <laughs> sure, exactly. Especially early on, right? I mean, build up that. Well, the postal that... service thing with his dad. I mean, that was cool. it, it, it's. I can't wait to talk to him. I, I would say, yeah. I can't wait to talk to him. I hope that I do get to sit down and have a right. beer with him and, and talk about his love of my cousin, which would be great. It'd be a lot of fun. And look. All my baseball cards. <laughs> and look, going back to what I said, because again, I don't want people to think that I, I'm sitting here standing on the table, stomping and moaning about the, the fact that only a few questions were asked at the press conference. I don't expect him to have perfectly conveyed answers to mass in, in some of these different issues, you know, that he, he was asked about the naming rights uh, to the ballpark and there probably is going to be a, a, a corporate name attached to Camden Yards at some point. And look, it's, that's everywhere now, right? I, I mean, people will still call it Camden Yards in the same way that at whatever they're calling Heinz Field now in Pittsburgh, they, they still call it Heinz Field because that's just what it's called. What is it? sure Stadium or whatever it is. But look, we, we you need revenue, right? I mean, teams need revenue, especially if you want to spend more money on baseball players. I mean, that's part of it. They've got to figure out TV. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to ask about Masson. Did I think that David Rubin's time was going to have the solution to my question? No, but it needs to be posed, right? These are issues that the baseball team very much faces, like every baseball team faces. Fundamental in issues about the operation yeah. of the team and media. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So to your point, I don't think they have all that figured out just yet. That's why it's going to be so critical for him to hire the right people and for there to be the proper vision and for them to voice that vision in the coming days. And it doesn't mean that the next press conference needs to be Tuesday uh, before the Kansas City game, but you're hoping it's at some point in the not too distant future, sometime in the, the next few weeks or the next month or so, something like that. Uh, he doesn't need to be Jerry Jones and speaking after every game or after every week or anything like that. I think that can be counterproductive as well. but be visible, be present, uh, show people that you care, uh, go out and meet people, uh, talk to fans, talk to media, uh, get get an idea of what fans and media think uh, about this. Uh, to your point, if you don't have a lot of experience in terms of how the day-to-day -day and baseball operations and how t t sports television works, you know, look at all those things. Survey, right? Uh, I mean, it's go out and talk to people and, and really – Get a get a sense for what, how people feel about certain topics, and if you do that, I like his chances. He's not going to bat a thousand. You know, he's not going to get everything perfectly right. But I think if you care, 
if you hire the right people, you come in with the idea that you want to make this great. You're seeing what it looks like on the field right now, and, and you want to make it great in every other way as well. Then I like their chances because uh, he, he certainly has the wealth, right? I, I mean, his his net worth and all of that. Uh, there there seems to be an enthusiasm. I mean, see seeing him and the three other primary partners uh, of this investor group uh, standing on the top step of the dugout watching the opening day ceremonies. They have their 24 Orioles jerseys on, you know, for 2024. I mean, you can just tell they're excited. They're having fun with that. And look. You and I can never imagine what it would be like to be an investor for a major league baseball team to have, to have that kind of a financial wherewithal to, to to be involved in something like that. But we all but we know what it means to be a part of something like that that is part of a community and part of something that people really care about in the wake of a civic tragedy. You know what and, I said once to Steve Bashotti, it. it's funny you'd say that. I said to Steve Bashotti, I said to him, and this is back when I was a little more invested and, and not mistreated. Um, I said to him, I said, you know, it's, it's crazy. You're a billionaire. And when you win, you get that emotion that you love that the team win. We all get the same feeling, you know, yeah. when the team wins. And I, I, I know, I know this, from taking buses back from New England all night and from flying in airports at four o'clock in the morning upside down in Detroit and having people come up that when they win and taking phone calls on Monday morning here for 30 years, when they win, everybody gets the same feeling that the owner gets when they win, right? I mean, like it, it's, you don't, you don't have to be a billionaire to feel good about the team winning if that's what makes you feel good, right? He doesn't feel a billion times better. He maybe he's making money on it. And he's, he might beat filet mignon tonight. You eat Salisbury steak, but like whatever. But the feeling of winning and the feeling of being involved and the feeling of community, that that's what baseball's meant for. That's why the bleachers were out there. It's meant for everybody. And that's the part that Peter got so wrong. I mean, I remember I had Janet Marie on talking about the stadiums this week and uh, it was unbelievable conversation also about the key bridge uh, and she's a Baltimorean. So, um, you know, even more so, but just talking about the stadium and the money and what he's got $600 million to do something with the stadium. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I guess I think about all these, the, the years that have gone by with ownership and all of these things, Charlie Steinberg came in here uh, maybe 2009 Eight, eight or nine, and Charles ran the Orioles uh, at PR, and, and and was famously Eddie Murray's best friend, and like all of that. He runs the Worcester Polar Cats, I, whatever the Worcester Massachusetts Red Sox team is that they took from Pawtucket. He has Polar Park and like all that stuff. Um, and he came into my studio and he's flipping his Boston Red Sox World Series rings, like literally, right? And he said to me. For Peter to call you a very unimportant person, he's like, there are no unimportant people in baseball. Everyone's important in baseball. And he said, that's got to be like for have to have an owner call anyone unimportant speaks to it wasn't I was unimportant. We were all unimportant to Peter. And um, and that went on for a generation. And some people felt it and some people didn't. And I'd walk around when they're losing 115 games and people are paying full price and I'm scratching my head and. You know, Alan and I are fighting, <laughs> you know, and, and I said, like, he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about anything. He's shown that over and over and over and over and over again. And this guy is shown day one. He cares. He's there. He's present. All of these things that if I would have said, I could never say that about Peter because Peter could never change. And it, it, it But if I could have changed anything, you know, if I could make things differently, um, I, I would say that day one, you know, having kids you meet in the team store run out, having uh, a smile on your face, being available, um, not lying uh, yet, <laughs> hopefully never, um, but understanding that the community, that it really is about that kid at Harlem Park that may like baseball and you have to and may not be able to afford baseball, right? In a lot of ways, that's a big issue for all of them is the affordability. Mm -hmm. And um, because it used to be cheap, my dad would take me out. It was never a, a, a financial hardship for my dad and I to go to sit in the bleachers. We didn't have much, but my dad had a ten dollar bill, and we would, literally we would get on the bus. He had a pass, so the bus was free for him because he took the bus to work every day. He had the monthly pass, so it was free for him to go to the ballpark. It was a quarter for me to get on the bus, and the tickets were you know a buck and a quarter, buck and a, what bleachers, you know. And, and we would get our hot dogs in Highland Town, save a little bit of money, but. Part of it is, can you afford to go to the ballpark? What kind of family are you? Do you want to go to the ballpark 30 times a year and can only go 
five? Do you want to go 80 times a year in a perfect world? You go every night if you could, if you could, and you financially can't, you know? So there, there's that spirit of enthusiasm that baseball's always had to be a television sport at home that getting people back downtown, not just to stimulate the economy and the money, but to fill the place up because sure. um, who makes the magic of Oriole baseball happen, Luke? Who makes the magic happen? It's the fans. You I mean, make the magic happen. Yeah. You make the magic happen. So that that would be a message that I, I always had for Peter that was never heard. But the fans are the one – they're the reason you're here. And right. it's been a long, long time since anybody said that ever in that organization. Like literally, it's been a long time. So for that, I'm grateful. I'll just say that. I'm very grateful couple things. I, I want to go back to something that you mentioned just a couple minutes ago where you talked about you want him to be as excited about winning as the fans are. I'll, I'll turn that on its head. I want this ownership group to also take the losses hard too, right? I mean, look, they're going to make money on this thing. I mean, we saw what individuals who've owned franchises for just a few years, we see how it appreciates in value, right? So David Rubenstein and, and the partnership Whenever they cash out, whenever it happens, they're going to be better off financially for it. But I, I want no matter to how be... you operate it, exactly. <laughs> as so, <you're> saying... <laughs> yeah. so as much as he's talking about wanting to win World Series, World uh, a World Series, we also know they're going to lose, right? We, we know that they're not necessarily going to win the World Series this year. They might lose in the ALCS. They might not make the playoffs if if they have a couple untimely injuries to the wrong guys. But you want there to be that that sense of living and dying with the club as well. And, and look, I mean, ownership and, and those that are in charge, they have to make difficult decisions. And, and we understand that. And there is, it is a business side. And, you know, to your point about the, the financial challenges of some fans trying to go to the ballpark, I mean, that's always going to exist to some degree, right? I mean, that's just, it's just the same way that groceries or gas or anything else we're talking about. But going but, to the ballpark is expensive, so it needs to be awesome. It needs to be special. Sure. It needs to be something you look forward to. And it that's needs where, to be, right? And and there needs to be an imagining of ways to make it less expensive, at least at times, right? And we've talked about that. I mean, one thing that they had done in recent years, you know, the, the Kids Cheer Free program they did, you know, which kind of got messed, turned on its head by by the, the pandemic and, and, you know, the the bleacher seats, you know, during the week, uh, much cheaper the last couple of years. So they've done some of that, but you need to do more of that. And, and then the other thing that I do want to mention, because you had mentioned to me or you had posed the question to me, uh, a takeaway from the press conference. And and maybe we touched on this briefly, but I just wanted to reiterate it. I mean, Rubenstein went out of his way to call Mike Elias the best general manager in, in baseball. He went out of his way to call Brandon Hyde the best manager in baseball. Uh, and right off the bat, to your point, talking about wanting there to be honesty, integrity, and making good decisions, letting the right people run the right aspects of the organization, you know, that that's that's putting a, a spotlight on, on his general manager and manager in a positive way and saying, I trust you. I've come in here and I'm brand new, but you guys have done the work. I'm not firing you. No, nobody's in the newspapers right. or in the media saying right. Mike Elias and Brandon Hyde are a problem. Not at all. Exactly. Like, or, or, or the, or the owner was non-committal in a big picture sense or anything like that. He flat out called them the best in baseball at what they do. Now, whether that's actually, whether he truly 100% believes that or whether he's just wanting to give a, an, an appropriate and deserved vote of confidence to the, the general manager and the, and the manager, it was good to hear that. Right. And I think from that standpoint, that's where, look, I'm excited about new ownership. I'm excited, excited about the potential. But I'll say this. The last thing I want is and I'll even say this about someone that is one of my all time favorites. The last thing I want is Cal Ripken, Cal Ripken to come in and start meddling with what Michael Elias is doing. And I don't I, I don't mean Cal in terms of having a rapport and having a dialogue with these guys because hey, it's a hall of famer. Same, same I'd say about Palmer, Eddie Murray, whoever. I mean, I want them to be present. I want them to be involved, but you don't want them to meddle. You don't want them to try to fix something that isn't broken. And look, I'm not, I'm not being accusatory here of saying that, but that's crazy. Cal want... Ripken owns part of the Orioles today. That's right. crazy. But, but, uh, but I'm just saying <laughs> you want that to be harmonious because things on the baseball side are working so well, that doesn't need to be fixed. That just needs, some augmentation, right, in terms of payroll and going out and fortifying the roster if necessary, extending some of your young players that you feel are worth extending for the long run. 
and to just make something, take something that's already really good on the field and do what you can to make it even better. And that's where, you know, that's not a, I don't want to convey that as a concern, but I'm just saying that's something that the new ownership group doesn't need to fix. There's lots that needs to be fixed in this organization and lots that need, that will need to be figured out. Uh, TV and and stadium renovations, the land lease uh, surrounding you know the ballpark and, and uh, any potential development there. You know they've got to figure all that out. But there isn't a whole lot to figure out on the baseball side right now, other than to can we take something that's very good and make it great? Can we take something that might be great already and make it super great? You know, and what can we do to sustain it? What can we do to make sure that this is going to be something that isn't just great and fun? and really good in 2023 and 2024, but two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. So that's just something I wanted to throw out there that he was so complimentary and I get it. It's kind of a captain obvious thing to say about about the defending manager of the year in the American league and uh, Elias, who was recognized as an executive of the year, at least by some publications out there and what have you, but it was good to hear it nonetheless, because again, when you are talking about new ownership, uh, they will have a vision for how this is going to look. And chances are, and better not, quite frankly, it's not going to look the same as how the Angelos family viewed things. And uh, you hope that that's going to mean much better uh, in other aspects of the organization moving forward. I'm going to let you drop the mic on that, because if you said better than the Angelos family did, I, I can't put any better than that. Uh, Orioles are up. Uh... Perfect so far. It's uh, been a far less than perfect week around here. Uh, I still haven't had the guts to look up and see the key bridge missing uh, driving on the east side. I went over to Costas to uh, hold vigil the other night and it was cloudy. You couldn't see anything uh, and raining. So um, we'll get over there this week and um, trying to lift the city. Baseball teams trying to lift the city. Luke and I spent three days chasing NFL folks around. One of us had a delicious Ritz Carlton breakfast with fluffy eggs and crispy bacon and perfectly cooked uh, potatoes. Um, one of us had, uh, <laughs> I'm like Oliver Twist, you know, I had the oatmeal. Uh, I, I had the, I had the porridge. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, well, I did. I had the porridge at the Holiday Inn on the buffet line there in the morning. It was it was delicious. It wasn't too pasty. I added a little extra hot water uh, and some. Uh, they they had some golden raisins on the on the buffet. Uh, <laughs> um, we're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. I was at Fadley's before the game on Thursday. We're going to be at Costas on the ninth. Probably doing some sort of key bridge relief in some way. Um, the peninsula is trapped down there. I'm going to be talking a lot about that and people who. Um, live and and work on the the uh, the Anne Arundel County side, not being able to get across the bridge quickly, and vice versa. Um, just it's been it's been a week. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, we're going to be on the ninth at Costas. There is an Oriole game that day at two o'clock. The Orioles play the Red Sox. We're going to be there early in the day. We're going to watch the Orioles play the Red Sox. That's next Tuesday, and then on Friday the twelfth, we're going to be continuing our live. You are live at Fadley's. It's Fadley's Fridays Live. It's all brought to you by the Maryland Lottery. Uh, I will probably have some. Pac-Man scratch-offs to give away. They've assured me there's no Mrs. Pac-Man, not this year. That's for next year. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. Enjoy a beautiful spring weekend here. We're at it at BaltimorePositive.com.